All right, our next presenter is Guha, Guha Shankar. Um, he's the Folklife folk Specialist at the American Folklife Center, Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., uh, where he participates in a range of outreach programs and documentation efforts, including serving as director of the Civil Rights History Project, a national oral history collecting initiative. He also conducts training workshops in ethnographic research methods and skills-based training and field documentation at home and abroad, with an emphasis on providing such assistance to indigenous communities. He has produced and edited films on material cultural traditions and community life, with several of them completed while, while with the Smithsonian Institution Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage between 1985 and 1993. Shankar earned his PhD in 2003 from the Department of Anthropology, University of Texas at Austin, with a concentration in folklore and public culture. And his presentation is Sound Sites and Sites of Activism in, in, in 68. Welcome, Shankar. Yeah. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, thank you to my fellow presenters, and especially thanks to all of you who have managed to make it through this very long day and uh, are only slightly yawning. It's okay. It's 4.45 and it's uh, getting, getting to uh, quitting time. So let me begin uh, by uh, saying that my remarks today constitute the early studies of a case study I'm developing, uh, hopefully for a publication, and hopefully for a publication on something other than the Guha Shankar Vandy Press blog. Um, the case study is about the ways in which multi-format archival research collections can illuminate and inform current outreach efforts ranging from scholarly gatherings to gallery exhibitions, to media productions, to social action campaigns. Uh, by multi-format historical collect research collections, I mean aggregations of materials and repositories which encompass sound recordings, still images, and textual items, among other things. Um, and while this may not uh, need saying uh, in the context of this conference, as a, a curator and program specialist, I want to stress the point that uh, providing wider access to such collections is critically important in helping deepen the public discourse about the past and arrest, hopefully, the depressing slide towards historical amnesia, uh, an all too common affliction in this ADD adult age of ours. Right. Thank you, Mom. Um, next week, uh, beginning on May 14th, actually three days from now, the Poor People's Campaign, under the leadership of the Reverend Drs. William Barber and Liz Theo Harris launches a six-week nationwide nonviolent direction action campaign in at least 30 states and the District of Columbia. In Annapolis, here in Maryland, there will be a rally at the state capitol on the 14th, and in D.C., a march is scheduled on the U.S. capitol. Further actions such as demonstrations, teach-ins, town hall meetings, musical performances, art making, and so on are planned uh, in, until June 2018. In the words of its organizers, the campaign will, quote, force a serious national examination of the enmeshed evils of systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, and the war economy. For those of us with long memories, or those of us who are historians of this, the resonance of the present planned action with its antecedent, the Poor People's Campaign of 1968, is unmistakable, and I'll take a minute to explain how that, how that is so. Dr. Martin Luther King's vision for a mass action campaign to call attention to poverty in this country began to take shape over the course of 1967 and until 19, in, into 1968. He saw it as a collaborative initiative between the Christian, Southern Christian Leadership Conference and other community-based organizations uh, across the country. The notion was that a multiracial coalition of poor, disenfranchised people from across the country would engage in civil disobedience in the nation's capital to call for dramatic redistribution of wealth, an end to poverty and economic oppression, an end to the Vietnam War. They would argue for subsistence rights and land claims, among many other demands. The goal was to force Congress to pass a comprehensive economic bill of rights for the poor, a goal that Robert F. Kennedy endorsed along with the plans for large-scale civil disobedience planned by the organizers. Deeply shaken by Dr. King's murder in April 1968, the coalition nevertheless launched the PPC a little over a month later on May 12, 1968. Uh, in its first public demonstration, which was a Mother's Day march and rally in Washington, uh, the, the march was led by Coretta Scott King. Oh, sorry, I got the date wrong, uh, May 14th. Subsequently, a multiracial aggregation of around 6,000 people, although the, offic uh, the official numbers say it was 3,000, uh, recent research has turned up the names of over 6,000 individuals who registered 
to uh, come and live uh, on the Mall uh, in, from May to June. Uh, the coalition, including African Americans, Appalachian whites, Native Americans, Chicanos, Puerto Ricans, descended upon DC for a five week stay. Even as the city was still reeling from the aftermath of the, for, of the uprising and destruction of the city, uh, many parts of the city following Dr. King's murder. They set up temporary shanties near the reflecting pool of the National Mall and named the spot uh, Resurrection City. They arrived by mule train from the rural south and by bus from the north, west, and southwest of the United States. Residents ate, slept, made music in the soul tent, played in the reflecting pool, and shared experiences with one another across racial and ethnic lines. Each day, they demonstrated on the steps of government agencies to demand equal access to employment and job training, livable wages, quality education, health care, nutritious food, and safe, affordable housing, and participated in marches to meet the staff in several federal agencies to demand rights and justice. Even for people who already knew hard times, life in Resurrection City was made even more so by torrential rains which turned the place into a mud pit, mud pit for most of the times it was in existence. Wrote the Washington Post, the meanderings of the growing population and the steady stream of tracks bringing materials for new shanties turned the city's lanes into narrow strips of deep, sticky mud. The plywood shanties became islands in the bog and health officials expressed alarm over the conditions. Nearly a week later, on June 24th, uh, after the Juneteenth rally, uh, with living conditions deteriorating and the population dwindling, Resurrection City was dismantled when its permit expired and the structures were bulldozed by DC and the National Park Service police. With the 50th anniversary of 1968 uh, campaign, while the 50th anniversary of 1968 campaign has animated fresh accents for social change, such as the new Poor People's Campaign, Educational and cultural memory institutions such as the Library of Congress, the Smithsonian Institution, and the District of Columbia Public Library have launched several initiatives to make their historical collections and programs speak to the present moment. The collections we hold provide much needed historical context, such as first person perspectives and a wealth of documentary evidence for a range of outreach uh, efforts by those institutions. Especially for the American Folklife Center, the anniversary of archival materials provide great opportunities to keep adding to several layers of public program, several years of public programming focusing on civil rights and social justice. In this presentation, I'm going to highlight two collections of the AFC that are central to our efforts on the topic. The Bruce Jackson, Diane Christian collection, uh, some, which you see here, and the Civil Rights History Project collection, which I'll talk about a little later. The Jackson Christian collection consists largely of audiovisual documentation co collected by University of Buff uh, Buffalo professor Bruce Jackson over the course of a 40-year career as a documentary. It includes recordings on analog reel-to-reel -reel and cassettes from his field research on topics such as the blues, cowboy music, prison songs, interviews about life in penitentiaries, some conducted with death row inmates, and also recordings related to his academic work at the University of Buffalo. Uh, Bruce was also past president of the American Folklore Society at one point in his career. In addition, there's a large amount of photographs, over 50,000 images, some of which you will see in just a second, and the accompanying negatives for them as well, uh, along with film elements for documentaries that he and his creative partner and wife, Diane Christian, produced and collaborated on. The audio and film materials are housed at the center, but Jackson retains his photographs for now with the promise that they will be in the center's archive one day. Uh, hopefully that one day comes very soon, we hope. Within the Christian Jackson collection, and I say this for the benefit of you who might want to go spelunking in the archives, spelunking is a technical term known to archivists. It, calls, it means taking a deep dive in, and you might come out eventually with a lot of really interesting stuff like I happen to. Uh, within the uh, Jackson Christian collection, there's a distinct subset which consists of Jackson's original recordings and photographs of the 1968 Poor People's Campaign, duplicates of news broadcast, uh, reel-to-reel -reel recordings he obtained from CBS News, uh, the folklorist Henry Glassie's field recordings, and duplicates of recordings made by Ralph Rinsler, the folklorist and organizer of the music programs of the Soul Tent in Resurrection City, and the uh, first director of the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage, and also the man who put together the Festival of the Mall way back in 1967. Uh, so the non-CBS recordings uh, came into being because the Newport Folk Festival Foundation, of which Bruce was a member, had linked up with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference to provide cultural programming principally folk and traditional mu uh, music performers, the residents of Resurrection City. As we know, freedom songs and music more generally were an integral part of the civil rights era, and no less so in Resurrection City. 
According to Jackson, with whom I had a recent conversation, the musical program in the Soul Tent was principally the work of Rinsler and included performers like the Georgia Sea Island Singers, Bernice Reagan, Pete Seeger, Libba Cotton, as well as Native American performers like Lucille Knight and Mrs. Crow Flies High. As my colleagues at the DCPL note, uh, Restoration City's Many Races Soul Center, or Soul Tent, became a site of cultural exchange where residents could celebrate shared experiences of struggle through music and cultural expression. Many of the group's sing-alongs and uh, f music festivals by overseen by mainstays the Reverend Frederick Douglas Kirkpatrick, a noted civil rights activist, singer-songwriter, and associate of Dr. King and his musical partner, Jimmy Collier, and the recordings document a number of such sessions. I'm going to play a couple of recordings for you in just a second, but what you see on the screen are some of Bruce photo Bruce's photographs from the initial days of the encampment called Resurrection City. Uh, what's happening, as you see, is people coming together to put up the plywood uh, and tent shack, uh, plywood shacks and uh, shanties. There are messages scrawled on the board, uh, members gather, uh, some coming off the buses, which have, uh, brought them in from across the country. Kids bathing in the reflecting pool. Try doing that these days and see how far you get. And just generally hanging out. So in the Many Races Soul Center tent, what you had were speeches about what the aims and uh, uh, methods of the Poor People's Campaign was going to be. There was press coverage off and on throughout the course of the uh, stay. Here you see the Reverend Kirkpatrick playing in the sing-along. This is John Davis of the Georgia Sea Island Singers. And Kirk, as he was known, leading a sing-along outside. Oh, do we know who that is? Reverend Kirkpatrick with Alan Lomax walking into the Soul City tent. The story goes that uh, the famed uh, music collector, song collector Alan Lomax, who was uh, also involved with Newport Folk Festival, was not invited to be present at the uh, programming of the tent, but he showed up anyhow and proceeded to sort of throw his weight around a little bit, much to the chagrin of Bruce and Ralph and uh, uh, annoying some of the organizers. Um, Alan, you see there, is walking with uh, the Reverend Kirkpatrick into the tent uh, in order to uh, you know, begin the sing-alongs. So let me play for you some of the music which is uh, played during the, over the course of the six weeks. These are the Georgia Sea Island Singers led by Bessie Smith. And uh, this is a song that they uh, used to sing to tell the people how they treated them. They wouldn't let them drink water from a dipper. They had to drink water from a gourd. They figured that the gourd was too, um, um, was just right for them, but the dip was too good for them. But the gourd was cool, and so the Lord blessed them to let us have the best thing to drink water from right on. This, this is not your true. My grandpa was 105, and they did this. So this is what they made of, that they give me a gourd to drink water. Can you say that? Give me the gourd to drink water. Let's see. Yeah, that's good. That's good. But you see, you said that this like you, the children say it now, because they're going to school to learn a whole lot. But, 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 in, but, in, but in those days, we say, give me the gold to drink water. So we going on now. Give me the gold to drink water. All right, we're going to want you all to help us sing it as we go along. Because truly, that's what they did to our four friends long years ago. Regular, regular, rolling under. Give me good drink water. Regular, regular, rolling under. Give me good drink water. Regular, regular, rolling under. Give me good drink water. Regular, regular, rolling under. Give me good drink water. Thank you. 
Next clip you'll hear is from the uh, Reverend Frederick Dick Douglas Kirkpatrick leading a sing-along outside the tent. Uh, Kirk uh, was a co-founder of the Deacons for Defense, uh, a group of uh, men who came back from the war and in Louisiana began a, pro a program of armed self-defense against white racists and supremacists. Uh, he was also a confidant and associate of the Reverend Martin Luther King. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, he and his partner Jimmy Collier were, you'll hear them throughout the recordings when you come and listen to them at the center. And let me see if I can play this one. So you heard that airplane noise in the back. Uh, that's one of the features of the recordings, which uh, you know is the nature of all festival and field recordings. You often hear planes go by. You hear the announcements on a loudspeaker, which was broadcasting the news of the day across Resurrection City. It adds to the charm of the recordings and gives you a sense of immediacy, which you obviously would not get within a production studio. Uh, as I mentioned before, part of the uh, emphasis was on making sure that cross-cultural exchange and that the representation of representatives of many different ethnic communities who were there all got a chance to share and uh, participate in these kinds of you know, uh, community events. And to that end, here's a recording from Mrs. Lucille Knight and Mrs. Crow Flies High from uh, Native Americans uh, Sioux, uh, the Sioux community from North, South Dakota. Well, I'm going to sing a praise song because all of you people are here, helped us and supported us today. So you'll hear uh, an Indian song. Another interesting set of recordings within those collections uh, are those of Henry Glassie's. Again, my conversation with Bruce Jackson, he explained that folklorist uh, Glassie was contracted by the Foundation Board to accompany and document the reactions from people from one of the several caravans that converged on DC in May. 
Uh, Glassy's recording offer a singular perspective, it seems to me, to the viewpoint of participants who constituted the Western Caravan, or the Los Angeles contingent. Uh, this particular group of folks left by bus on May 15th and headed through Arizona, Texas, New Mexico, Utah, Colorado, Missouri, and Kentucky, arriving in D.C. on May 23rd. Uh, Henry actually has some really amazing photographs from his time on the uh, bus uh, at the Rinsler, Rinsler Archives. Uh, I could not secure permission at that point uh, to get to make those available, but they are pretty uh, uh, stunning in terms of what they reveal of life on the road. And this one is an interview on the bus. Uh, what my preliminary auditions of the three digitized real-to-real -real recordings from Glassy's collection, which total about three hours, indicate the recorded first-person testimonies from participants, some of which were obtained while traveling on the bus, with others made at rest stops along the way. Uh, I'm not really sure about that because the written documentation and field notes have yet to be turned up, and I hope that the Rinsler Archives will shed some light on the subject. Uh, the questions that he asked are fairly straightforward in the nature of information gathering on backgrounds of participants and their motivations for making the journey to Washington, D.C. The interviews with adult participants ask them to reflect on the present state of society and to share their thoughts with the recording. The reportage is by Glassy and his interviewing partner, an unidentified woman who often asks questions of the other writers on the bus. Here's an example of an interview with one of the adult participants identified as Mrs. Pearson. Um, I will also note that we, uh, on occasion, we hear song leaders trying to get group singing going, uh, kind of a ragged effort. And the recordings also include several instances of riddles and nursery rhymes told by children who accompanied their parents uh, to Glassy, uh, the sort of traditional things that folklorists collect. So here's the interview with Mrs. Pearson. Get your true opinion of how you truly want to go on this march. Now, if you want to talk to the thing, we'll really talk, and if you don't... Yes, I want to talk. It's very difficult to say why I'm here. Each time that I talk to you, I can give a different reason, a different, just a different answer about why I'm going to Washington. And they're all psychotic to me because I live in a psychotic country. One minute I want to go to try to change it, the next minute I want to go to try to kill everybody I see, and the next, the next minute when I go, maybe there's love in my heart, so I don't know. Maybe I, I'm just discontent like everybody else. I want to change. I want everybody to have. I just don't want, uh, let's say, the establishment which is, which is made up uh, of the majority, more or less, the whites, I know that's a word you don't want to hear. I think each and every American should have an opportunity to work. When a man is busy, he But first, Mrs. Ms. Pearson, we, uh, the word white, we love to hear that. So don't ever think that no one wants to hear the word white or no one wants to hear the word black. But the word, that, that point is all right. But we just want to get your opinion on uh, why you come on this march. And you don't have to hide anything. I just want the truth. If you feel like that you should say. Jackson's recording. Oh, let me just make sure that I get this in. Um, this is metadata for the collection. That is to say, the tape recordings uh, and the notes written on them constitute the extent of what we know about the recordings. So every one of these recordings needs to be uh, listened to, to, uh, under, uh, to be understood in its entirety. Uh, we need to match up uh, whether or not these names actually appear, uh, that appear on the tape boxes, actually appear on the recordings, and so on. It's a process we've been undertaking between uh, the Folk Life Center and uh, our colleagues at the DCPL, um, and we hope to have some results fairly soon. Uh, Jackson also recorded, uh, finally, towards the end of the campaign on Juneteenth, uh, which was Solidarity Day. Uh, it featured speeches by the Reverend Ralph Abernathy, Ossie Davis, Coretta Scott King, and music by Roberta Flack, Eartha Kitt, Peter, Paul, and Mary, and others. Uh, this is the crowds gathered on the mall uh, at the Lincoln Memorial. And Bill Cosby was there. And there was a crowd of about 50,000 that listened to the speeches. And I want to play this one excerpt. I just skipped it, I think, sorry. Um, what I'm particularly interested in here is that Ossie Davis reminds the crowd of 50,000 that the campaign was part of the long and tra tragic struggle for civil and human rights, part of the civil rights movement. And he does so by reading a roll call of names of those who had fallen.
minute of silence was called for <coughs> to commemorate the death of Dr. William Edward Du Bois. I would like all of you who are sitting to stand and join me in a silent tribute as I read the names of some of those who have since died in our long unending struggle. Medgar Evers, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, Michael Schroener, James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, Malcolm X, Jimmy Jackson, Reverend James Reed, Mrs. Viola Liuzzo, Dr. Martin Luther King, Senator Robert Francis Kennedy. So, second section, which I want to conclude here with, is called Documenting in Retrospective. The first is the sort of the raw uh, interviews uh, and the historical interviews. I'm going to talk about the Civil Rights History Project collection very briefly. Uh, this was a project done in conjunction uh, with the National Museum of African American History and Culture. It's a five-year project, and we use the term five in quotes because we actually started in 2010 and we didn't finish till 2016. Uh, I don't know whether that's sort of typical government you know, slopping over into like other fiscal years or something, but we have now completed the entire uh, run of collections. Uh, this particular collection, it seems to me, is important uh, insofar as it uh, resonates with recent critical scholarship, uh, particularly with regard to the you know, Poor People's Campaign, which persuasively argues that the narrative of failure that has framed the 68 campaign focuses too narrowly on the lack of sweeping redress at the legislative level for poor people and ignores the many smaller gains. Gordon Mantler in particular, a historian at George Washington, has pointed to such things as increased funding for free and reduced lunches for school kids and for Head Start programs in southern states that eventuated after the end of the campaign. The federal government provided assistance in the form of commodities to the nation's 1,000 poorest communities, and food stamp programs were expanded. Uh, meanwhile, other marches, particularly Chicano activists, spoke of the ways in which that participating in the campaign enlarged their wor world views helped them gain a greater insights into shared struggle, struggle across racial and ethnic lines, and how they became sophisticated in their thinking about the factors that constituted oppression and injustice. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out of this uh, particular uh, PowerPoint and see if I can find an interview for you from uh, Carlos Montes, who is a Brown Beret, a Chicano activist, uh, and somebody who participated in the march uh, in 1968. You know, every day was a different march, you know. And what started happening, is, uh, is the, I started to see that the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, uh, the leaders were sometimes apprehensive of what we wanted to do. We wanted to be more militant, more direct action. And uh, I, I remember that, you know, that Martin Luther King had invited the participation of the Chicano movement. So he could, uh, the, which was the original idea of the Rainbow Coalition. The original Rainbow Coalition have Chicanos, have Native Americans, whites, and blacks. And then that was in, in February and March, and he was assassinated. So, um, you know, they remember that, that the Crusade, the Brown Berets, and the uh, Alianza did not believe in uh, peaceful, nonviolence tactics. So I know that some of the lieutenants, like Reverend Abernathy, were concerned about that. But we, you know, but he couldn't renege on the invitation of King, so we, 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 were, we were in the march, and we pushed the envelope many times. The young people, the young Chicanos and black, we started getting a, a little, um, uh, what should I say, uptight with the older leadership, mm -hmm. and we said, we're gonna, we got, we have, we're gonna do our own march. So we went with the young people, we're gonna do our own march. Because there were marches every day. So then we said, we're gonna do our own march for youth, for young people, for education, for jobs for young, respect young people. So we recruited blacks, Native Americans, Chicanos, and we're gonna march on the White House. Yeah, right, and then the, every Nathy and them said, no, no, you know, no, don't, what are you guys doing, you should do it. So they, they sent some of the Chicano elders to talk to us, 
And they didn't try to talk us out of it directly, but I knew that's what they wanted us to do, not to do it. But we, we, did, we respectfully said we're going to do it. They said, okay, we'll do it. You know, we got our ass kicked. <laughs> we got arrested. So we marked on the White House. We marked on the White House. We wanted to have a meeting with uh, LB. Was LBJ? Was that LBJ back then? I forget. You were saying... We were at uh, Hawthorne. Was it Hawthorne School? Yeah, the school. Yeah, Hawthorne School. Yeah, we were staying at Hawthorne School. That's where all the Chicanos and Native Americans uh, were staying there. Um, and you, did you go down to, to Resurrection City? We did. We, we, we were down to Resurrection City. We yeah. would go down there. We, we, would, uh, we didn't stay there, you know. And, and later on, when it started raining and flooding and getting hot, we were saying, man, good thing we didn't stay here because they got flooded. Right. right. And it was really crowded. Um, but we would go there. You know, we would go down there and have meetings with the blacks and the other groups. So we met a whole lot of different organizations. We met Puerto Ricans, we met blacks from different organizations, different cities, uh, whites from the South and Appalachia, Native Americans. It, it was a, um, a major learning experience. So what do you think, I mean, this might not be a, an easy one to answer, but what do you think the effects were on the Brown Berets of having participated? Well, it, it definitely uh, opened up our mind to see there was a wider struggle, wider struggle in the U.S. Before that, you know, we used to to blame white racism and our oppression on the white man. The white man is the enemy, you know, the honky, the white man, the whitey, right? And to me, the, the, the beginning of the poor people experience and all of that changed to say it's not the white man, it's, it's the, the one percent that's used nowadays or the corporate structure or the rich people. And uh, the rich corporations uh, is the enemy that uh, they monopolize and, and uh, they discriminate. So um, there was a major, um, I started seeing, I guess you could call it class analysis. Mm -hmm. It was a, the, the upper class and the working class. And um, that it was a wider struggle. It wasn't just LA or the Southwest, it was a national struggle. And even so that it was a wide, worldwide struggle uh, the example of the Vietnamese, uh, Africa, Latin America against the U.S. domination of their economies uh, politically and, and militarily, like in, in uh, Puerto Rico or in Cuba, right? And uh, so, so it was it was a uh, political transformation for me and and many of the other Brown Berets. But I, I think not all the Brown Berets made that trans transformation. So, that was Carlos Montes, and I did have Maria Varela, but in the interest of time, I'm going to have to stop that. And metadata, full robust record, uh, populated with subject terms, uh, technical information, all of those things that are possible in the controlled environment that we've been producing these interviews in. Um, and I hope you noticed the, uh, the exclamation point as opposed to the question mark. Um, it's what we live with at the uh, American Folk Life Center and other repositories. So how does all this work going forward? Um, 2017 to 2018, I would urge you all to go down to the uh, Museum of African American History and the exhibit curated by Aaron Bryant called City of Hope uh, PP on the PPC. They'll run through 2018. Uh, from May through December of 2018, there'll be public programs at the DC Public Library locations, installations, listening sessions of speeches and music from the Jackson, uh, Rinsen, and other recordings, uh, storytelling, musical performances as the DCPL seeks to serve its con constituency drawing upon archival collections. Uh, in June of 2018, uh, coming up next month, I invite you all to attend a scholarly symposium that will see participants from the 1968 Poor People's Campaigns as well as organizers from the new Poor People's Campaign. Uh, free of charge, uh, please come. Blogs, tweets, webcasts, social media abound and uh, proliferate everywhere. Uh, look for us at the Library of Congress website. Um, and by all means, please do, as I said, stop and take advantage of these programs. They're free, open to the public. They use your tax dollars. So thank you very much.
everybody's tired at the end of the day. No questions? Hey. Guha, did you get a sense of the, the impact of the original Resurrection City on the public debate at the time? Or were there outcomes that you can we can point to from that effort? Um, the public debate around the 68 campaign is, you know, what I've read has been, as I said, just highly tinged. Oh, sorry. The, the public debate, as I've read about it, in uh, accounts like, say, uh, Gordon Mantler, um, Thomas Jackson and others uh, was largely negative. Um, it was seen as a place where, uh, you know, Calvin Tillis said, well, the poor people came to tell us that they're, that they're poor, tired, disorganized, and they look like they're tired, poor, and disorganized. I mean, that's a New York Times perspective. Um, generally, people said it's mud. Uh, the participants themselves said it was muddy. Andrew Young himself, who was part of the Southern Christian leadership, said it was a huge failure because of the money that the uh, uh, SCLC spent on it. Um, and I think that that's been, by and large, the way in which people have seen the campaign and seen it, you know, what, what effect it had. And again, I refer back to the point that I made, which you know, amplifying what Gordon Mantler says and others have said, that the lack of sweeping changes uh, were certainly, uh, in the legislative sphere, certainly led to the notion that this grandiose thing just fizzled. And a lot of it, again, is laid at the door, uh, uh, the door of the fact that uh, the Southern Christian leadership just couldn't get its stuff together after King died. So there's part of that. Uh, theorization that um, without the head of the organization, everything just kind of collapsed and, and went, you know, went sideways. Um, and I think uh, for a lot of reasons that they may very well be right on the face of it, um, but in point of fact, what I think happened was a stronger sense, as you know, Carlos Montes and others talk about, a sense of shared identity across these different groups and communities. Um, and the fact that that original impetus is now being channeled again by Dr. Barber and uh, Dr. Thea Harris tells you that the idea never really died. So I'd say that's the success of it. The idea lived, long, uh, lived on long after its you know, original presumed demise. Um, that's, that's the way I would see it. But again, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not as immersed in it as other scholars might be. I could certainly point you a number of resources if you'd like. Thank you for the question. Any more questions for Guha? Okay, well, thank you, Guha. Thank you thank very you much. To all our presenters.